In my previous lecture, I called attention on two basic concepts that are important, uh, well, that are even needed for understanding anticipation, namely systems and the complexity. I mean, a broadly enough idea of system and uh, a sophisticated idea of uh, uh, complexity. In this lecture, I'm going to call your attention on a few very recent developments, so recent that they may have escaped attention uh, in some academic, uh, academic world. First of all, uh, I'm using anticipation as a kind of umbrella term covering a number of different fields and applications. So, foresight, uh, forecasting, uh, protection theory, prospection theory, and I will have a, a few uh, things to say about them. When I'm talking about anticipation, I'm considering any way of looking at the future, any forward-looking attitude. The first aspect to be aware of uh, is that during the past century, there has been an enormous number of studies on anticipation from many different fields and uh, in, developed in many different ways. We have been ideas developed from within philosophy, uh, from within biology, brain studies, psychology, economy, sociology, anthropology, and so on and so forth. And this already is a first piece of information, because if we are asked uh, about uh, uh, what has been done uh, uh, on uh, future studies, on better, the understanding of the future within a number of different scientific fields, uh, well, uh, many of us will be in trouble, because the, the, the topic understanding of the future is not one of the acknowledged uh, research topics. So, already understanding that something has been done, well, and I will show later that uh, an enormous amount of work has been done. A uh, commented bibliography has been published in 2010 on these studies, and it is a 100 page long bibliography, just to give a rough idea of how many um, efforts, how many studies, how many trials have been done in this field. The real issue is that we do not know, we still do not know whether the same idea has been discovered time of again, or whether different understanding of anticipation have been developed, whether the various theories are like uh, uh, different uh, underline, uh, the underlying of different aspects of the same uh, uh, courts, uh, the same body of knowledge, or whether completely different ideas have been uh, considered. But this lecture is not based on historical data. This lecture is based on recent developments. And the development I'm going to present to you are many, three major papers, three major publications, uh, one from the field of psychology, one from the field of anthropology, one from the field of economics, and three, these three papers, all them published in 2013, last year, so very recent, all them published by notable figures, by well-known scholars, and then I will enter into a few details. They all say the same, they all present the same message the way in which we have developed our fields, psychology, anthropology, economics, so far, is deeply limited. We have to rethink, we have to think again the way in which psychology, anthropology, and economics are, have been developed, and in which sense should we change them? We should send them the sense of explicitly introducing the future as a major research topic within our fields. And the interesting aspect, there are two aspects. One is that three 
well-known scholars have presented, have published papers saying the same things, the same year, which looks like something is in the air. There may be something like a, a, a different attitude that is growing within the human and social sciences. And why I'm saying so? Because they have published what they have published without knowing each other. I talked with all them, and they have done what they have done by considering only what was happening within their field, without considering and without being aware of similar discussions that were ongoing, that were under development in uh, related fields. And which are the scholars I am considering? Martin Seligman, past president of the American Psychological Association. Well, not the last psychologist in the world. Jens Becker, director of the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies. And Arjun Apadurai, one of the leading contemporary anthropologists. I mean, three well-known figures within their field. So, not three, it's, it's not that, I mean, three unknown scholars. Three well-established, very well-known figures with a name to respect, so to say. That, and all them, and here are the data, and then eventually for those that are interested, I can provide the bibliographic or the little bibliographical information. So, uh, let's start seeing in some details uh, uh, what they have written. My presentation today is a kind of, uh, maybe a slightly boring, in the sense that it's a collection of quotations. I'm just saying what, the, I'm just repeating what they have written, just to provide a kind of concrete understanding of what is present in their, in their papers. So, Seligman's paper is a major contribution to a new conception of psychology as a whole. It's a long paper, it's not written by Seligman alone. I mean, there are a number of co-authors. And it's a kind of reconstruction of the 20th century uh, psychology, the way in which 20th century psychology developed and why uh, something new is, uh, uh, is needed. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it, it is probably the only of the three papers with an explicit, uh, with the explicit nature of a paradigm, uh, paradigm shift. He explicitly says the way in which psychology has been done is deeply limited. He does not say wrong, but well, it's very easy to... Because so, because so far, psychology has been primarily past-oriented, as if the behavior of people depends on what happened before. Like if they were atoms, so to say, pushed by causal forces in the same way in which physical entities are pushed. And Seligman says, but people does not behave this way. There is more than that. And this more is an explicit consideration of the future. I mean, intentions, all what I mean, hopes, fears, whatever is present to people and whatever is, I'm not saying determining, but whatever influences the decisions people take has to do with their ideas, their feelings, their perception of what they see around, and these kind of things. So we should reshape psychology in a completely different way from the psychology that has been developed uh, and uh, selling those papers, well, it's a long paper, as I said, uh, there are historical reconstructions, I'm not entering into any discussion concerning behaviorism, cognitivism, you have to read the paper, it's a really worth reading paper. Uh, there is a huge amount of data provided, and uh, most of them are uh, on white rats. Oh, what have white rats to do with that? Well, if traditional psychology is wrong with white rats, well, there is reason to believe that it's wrong with us as well. And maybe there are more reasons to consider that what happens at the level of human beings is even more complex and sophisticated than what happens at the level 
at the level of y, right? And then it, it develops a number of uh, uh, sub theories and uh, criticisms of other theories concerning psychoanalysis, concerning Kahneman and Twers, the prosper theory. I mean, it's a very rich paper. I'm not. I will not enter in enter into any detailed technical discussion. I will just to give a flavor of what is in that paper. Let's start from the abstract. Prospection. Prospection theory is the theory of developed by Seligman. I mean, it's the theory that he's trying to, uh, to pre that he's presenting in his paper. Prospection, that is the representation of possible futures. It's a ubiquitous feature of the human mind. Much psychological theory and practice, in contrast, has understood human action as determined by the past and viewed any such teleology, bracket, selection of action in light of goals. So it's not the theology that was part of old metaphysical theories, obviously, a different understanding of the theory. As a violation of natural law, because the future cannot act on the present. Prospection involves no backwards causation. Rather, it is guidance not by the future itself, and in my next lecture I will have more to add on this issue, but for the time being that's enough. But by present, evaluative representations of possible future states. These representations can be understood minimally as if X then Y conditionals. And the process of prospection can be understood as the generation and evaluation of these conditionals. A wide range of evidence suggests that prospection is a central organizing feature of perception, cognition, effect, memory, motivation, and action. I mean, it's not something pertaining to some specific aspect of the way in which the mind works, but it's a general feature of the mind. The authors, the authors of the paper, speculate that prospection casts new light on why subjectivity is part of consciousness, what is free and willing in free will, and on mental disorders and their treatment. Viewing the behavior as driven by the past was a powerful framework that helped create scientific psychology. But accumulating evidence in a wide range of areas of research suggests a shift in framework in which navigation into the future is seen as a core organizing principle of animal and human behavior. Be careful, not only human behavior, is a general principle of life. I mean, the, the underlying claim, which is perhaps not completely explicit in Seligman paper, Seligman paper, is that life is anticipatory from the simplest form of living being, the mema, to the most beautifully complex forms of living entities like ours. The past is not a force that drives their needs and goals, but a resource. A resource from which they need the world. Selectively extract information about uh, in the individual, selectively extract information about the prospects they face. These prospects can include not only possibilities that have occurred before, but also possibilities that have never in a past oriented framework. There is a big problem with novelties with new situations, with surprises, but in a future-oriented framework, well, novelties and surprises are part of the game, are something that may always occur. The prospective organism must construct an evaluative landscape of possible acts and outcomes. The success or failure of an act in leading up to its prospect will lead not simply to satisfaction or frustration, 
but to maintaining or revising the evaluative representation that will guide the next act. So it's a continuous reframing what may happen, not only according to past experience, but also according to anticipation of what may eventually happen. At any given moment, an organism's ability to improve its chances for survival and reproduction lies in the future, not the past. So learning and memory too, learning and memory too, should be designed for action. Even memory is future oriented and not primarily or only past oriented. I mean, you see that I mean, everything changes. It's a completely different category of conceptual framework. These capacities actively orient, orient the organism toward what might lie ahead and what information is most vital for estimating this. Behaviorist learning theory, that's a, a great piece of, uh, did not even work for white rats in the laboratory. I mean, there is a huge evidence, experimental evidence, that the way in which psychology has been developed was deeply, uh, let's say, constrained. Some kind of deeply ideological, in a sense. It was as if there were no other way than using the past to do science. And, as Seligman said in the quotation I gave before, that has been extremely helpful at the beginning for establishing psychology as a scientific discipline. Because that was the only way, probably, to, to develop something like a science of the mind. But now, we have more, we can, can try something more than that. Psychoanalysis, okay, carefully done longitudinal studies have found disappointingly small effects on ch of childhood, childhood events on a range of adult behaviors. And they, all these are quotations from the papers of Seligman. The acceptance of expectations opens the way to a fundamental reorientation in thinking about how past experience influences behavior, not through the direct molding of behavior, but through information about possible futures. Choice now makes sense. Stretching well beyond actual experience and enabling them, the rats in this case, to improvise opportunistically on the spot. Attention to another core aspect of cognition, that is, oriented toward the prospection, the active, selective seeking of information, the exploration of the environment. If we are past oriented, there is no reason to explore the environment. All the information is already there. Only if we are future oriented, the exploring the, 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 the environment, exploring what is in front of us, makes sense. In this section, we offer an a priori argument for the centrality of expectation in current models of rational cognition and choice, and we then consider some striking evidence from ecology and neurophysiology that animals and humans might actually implement these models. Uh, I'm not entering, as I said, into specific technical details, but the basic idea is that start from expectation, then add observations of the environment, detect a discrepancy between observation and expectation, try to minimize that expectancy, that discrepancy, and then start again with the cycle. And there are a number of specific details on that, but they can be acquired at the second, uh, at the second, at the second. Generating simulation of the future can be conscious, but it is typically an implicit process. That's also a pretty robust plan. Our forward-looking attitudes. Well, there is no claim that our forward-looking attitudes are only explicit. 
most of them may be implicit. They may be at war below the threshold of awareness. Of course, there are also explicit, that is, cognitive attitudes toward the future, but there are many more attitudes of a different kind, maybe emotional or maybe at a different level, that war below the threshold of awareness. And as soon as we start realizing that there may be a number, a variety of ways of looking forward, some of which uh, we are aware of them, but some of which are, are working beyond our awareness, then the problem becomes how do they work together? Do they work in the same direction? Do they conflict one another? Or in which situations they can work together, so to say, reinforcing one another, in which situations instead they may eventually block or generate other problems? Uh, because explicitly we try to go in, a, in some direction and implicitly or unconsciously we in reality are going in a completely different. I mean, without a, a conceptual framework like the, the one provided by Seligman, it's, uh, it's difficult to raise these questions. So it's difficult to raise research questions that can eventually be answered. Uh, uh, and again, if some ways of looking at the future are implicit, unconscious, is there any strategy for making them explicit? And as soon as they became explicit, do they change their nature? Do they become something else? I mean, there, are, there is a huge amount of possible research questions that can arise from this perspective, uh, from this uh, research strategy. Much prospection appears to say the architecture of the optimal models developed a priori in philosophy, economics, and system analysis. Well, I have doubt about this last uh, quotation, but I am to, <laughs> to present it as well. Uh, okay, start with the question of what component psychological mechanisms or capacities a creature needs to have in order to be free and autonomous. Build a catalog that encompasses the full assortment of design features that make an agent free. Then there are abstract mechanical, uh, abstract metaphysical questions uh, brought. Again, I'm not sure that these catalogs can be uh, really developed, but nevertheless, that, uh, these are uh, minor issues within the, uh, the, big, I mean, the big vision presented by, uh, by Seligman. Okay, that's from psychology. Let's try to address anthropology. Why anthropology is interesting? Well, there are at least a couple of issues. One is, the anthropology we all know, known, uh, is a research field traditionally focused on, uh, well, non-industrial society, societies, and essentially uh, past-oriented. I mean, the main issue of anthropology so far has been how a community, a society, develops uh, its uh, sense of identity how culture, how local, traditional, typically culture, develops the sense of identity of a community, which is a pretty traditional, old, I mean, past-oriented attitude. And as uh, Apadurai says, its main focus, the focus of anthropology, has been the cultural reproduction of identity, which for the most part means analysis of the ways in which societies develop their sense of the past. Great. But both claims are no longer valid. Anthropology has begun to focus on both industrial societies and the ways in which societies develop their sense of the future. So, in the same sense, on the same footing, according to which a society needs a sense of the past, in order to construe its sense of identity, but a society needs a sense of the future as well. The problem is that we have, well, they have been working a lot in order to understand 
the, the ways in which societies develop their sense of the past, their sense of identity. So far, anthropologists have done very little effort in trying to understand the way in which societies develop their sense of the future, what is in front of them, what they can do, or what they can't do, according to the different types. And within anthropology, the recent debate on anthropology and the future has been ignited by Guyer uh, uh, in a paper of 2007. So it's been a few years that anthropologists have started the discussion of, well, have, have we something to say about the future and the ways in which societies... Uh, and as a matter of fact, there are a few dozen contributions on that. So, I mean, there are a few interesting papers that are worth reading. Here I will consider only a Padurai and a couple of uh, things uh, that I have extracted by uh, a book by Charles Payot uh, published a, couple, a few years ago. And uh, because this helps me in introducing another aspect that I have not mentioned at the beginning, an aspect that to some extent, or at least for somebody, may be interesting as well, namely the connection between theology and the future, which is something of a surprise in a sense. Okay, perhaps surprising from an European perspective, in West Africa, Pentecostal churches are the main forces forging a new understanding of the future. By urging a break with the past, including the rejection of the old structures of authority, these churches reshape temporality. In, in, in a way that I will uh, make clear in a moment. But uh, it may be, before that, it may be interesting to note, because this is a little known movement. It's a movement that may have some uh, deep consequences. Attention may be called to the fact that U.S. pastors are now traveling to Africa to be ordained, because they see African Christianity as a purer form before returning home to engage in mission work. This is a completely new movement. We have no historical precedence of this kind. There is more than mission work. The issue is not limited to rejection of the past. The real intriguing issue is that futures are replacing the past as cultural reservoir. Instead of looking at the past in order to try understanding what we should do, there are situations around us. They are still local situations. I mean, they are there, so they are extremely interesting to... Uh, I, mean, I, for one, <laughs> will be extremely interested in better understanding what's happening there. They are trying to learn what they have to do by figuring out their possible futures, which is, well, which is a real moment, which is something different from what we have learned uh, so far. Why our understanding of these Pentecostal mediated futures remarkably to you, the very possibility, the very possibility of using futures as cultural reservoir is central to the idea of anticipation. Which is the connection between uh, in general theology and the future. Uh, well, we all know, I, I'm not entering into, into the text, but uh, the basic idea is, you know, many, many religion, religions are based on scriptures, which implies that the truth is embedded in the sacred books. So we have to look at the past, we have to look at them in order to understand the real message of our uh, religion, if we have one. And at some point, especially within Christianity and possibly other traditions as well, the idea started to develop that the message may unfold in time. So even if what was written remains the same, but some of its content may become explicit in time. But there is more uh, than that. I, I'm just skipping a few, uh, few passages. Uh, if we look at what Karl Rahner, one of the leading theologians of the past centuries, century, 
brought what my father had that the future is not the future from a theological point of view is not simply the prolongation of our past nor merely the actualization or implementation of our present plans because such an understanding of the future would be primarily a projection of aesthetic present it is a future without surprises it is a future in understood as a continuation of what we have already seen the real future is uncertain and is not just the unfolding of our present ideas or strategies it is not simply a calculated human creation involving plans plus time rather the open future that comes to meet us brings surprises that's the real future a future that is the projection of the past plus present is digitalized the future is not a real future if we would like to understand the future we must include the component of the surprise we simplify the real future is always uncertain we cannot calculate real future in that sense we can approximate perhaps sometimes but there will be surprise in that that unforeseen future requires provisionality since it cannot be calculated or controlled this is exactly <coughs> what i will present in my next lecture not from a theological point of view but it is interesting that these ideas have been elaborated uh, have been considered also uh, within a theological framework well let's come back to anthropology and uh, a padurai uh, book a padurai's book he claims that in order to develop a systematic understanding of the future anthropologists should examine the interactions between three notable human preoccupations that shape the future as a cultural fact that is as a form of difference these are imagination anticipation and aspiration even if we have not yet found ways to articulate our anticipation imagination and aspiration come together in the work of future making so that is uh, we can recognize elements aspects components that helps in uh, like helps in developing a proper understanding of the future even if we still do not know how to properly deal with them there still many surprises in store there are many things that we still have to understand nevertheless as we refine the ways in which specific conceptions of aspiration anticipation and imagination become configured so as to produce the future as a specific cultural form or horizon we will be better able to place within this scheme more particular ideas about prophecy well-being emergency crisis and revolution we also need to remember that the future is not just a technical or neutral space but is shot through which affect and which senses thus we need to examine not just the emotions that accompany the future as a cultural thing, but the sensations that it produces and the ego excitement these are the things which makes things even worse obviously and more interesting at the same time the capacity to anticipate the future that okay here is where the, the, the sociological aspect uh, uh, intrudes is socially differentiated we do not have from within our society the same capacity to think of the future as we have different tastes as we, as we have different capacities uh, to understand art or music or mathematics or whatever and they are socially stratified in a very clearly distinguished way the same is for the future thinking properly thinking about the future requires training requires a framework a social framework in which those activities are supported 
are developed in which ways of doing those activities are socially accepted. Our own understanding that the capacity to aspire is unequally distributed. And that its skewed distribution is a fundamental feature and not just a secondary attribute of extreme poverty, for instance, one begins to grasp some of the deeper issues related to the future as a cultural reservoir. Not everybody has access to this reservoir. The access is socially differentiated. Some fragments or some aspects of society have an easier access to the future than others. As a step towards building a future reservoir where none is available, one might consider the productive role played by memory. Uh, I give just one or two of the exemplifications provided by Apadura. I just to show that the general picture is uh, accompanied by specific suggestions. For instance, while state-generated archives might primarily be instrumental of government <coughs> governmentality and bureaucratic bureaucrat okay, that power, <coughs> personal, familiar, and community archives, especially those of dislocated, vulnerable, and marginalized populations, are critical sites for negotiating paths to dignity, recognition, and political feasible maps for the future. Typically, the population, the part of the population, I mean, the poorest part of the population has no memory, has no trace of what they have done. So, making, giving them the possibility to have a bit of history, to have their own memory, is a form of empowerment. As simple as that, but that's a necessary, because if you do not have a memory, you do not have the capacity to look forward. I mean, the two components work together, and they reinforce one another together. Put differently, without the capacity to aspire as a social and collective capacity, words such as empowerment, voice, participation cannot be used. Anthropologists need to engage in a systematic effort to understand, that I mean, the anthropologist as scientist as coming back, to understand how cultural systems as combinations of norms, dispositions, practices and histories frame the good life as a landscape of discernible ends and of practical paths to the achievement to, of these ends. This requires a move away from the anthropological emphasis on cultures as logics of reproduction to a fuller picture in which cultural systems also shape specific images of the good life as a map of the journey from here to there and from now to then as a part of the ethics of everyday life. <coughs> this effort will evidence the difference between what Apadurai calls the ethics of possibility and the ethics of probability. The two terms are very similar, but the meanings are very, very different. The former is the ethics of possibility is based on those ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that increase the horizon of hope, that expand the field of the imagination, that produce greater equity in what he has the capacity to aspire. And that will widen the field of informed, creative, and critical citizenship. Conversely, the ethics of probability deals with those ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that flow out what Jan Hacking called the avalanche of numbers. They are generally, generally tied to the growth of a casino capitalism which profits from catastrophe and tends to back on disaster. Okay, let's move to the last part <coughs> of this presentation, namely uh, economics and what Becker uh, has to say about economics. Economics deals with the future in many different ways, we know that. Just to come back to, I mean, to, 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 to go back to a few basic issues. 
government deals with forecasts on the inflation rate or the, the increase or decline of the gross domestic product. We have heard this morning about that. Almost any aspect of the strategic management of companies concerns the future, from calculation to the production of goods uh, to long-term decisions about producing entire new goods or opening new factories and so on and so forth. In finance, as well, is entirely based on anticipation. If we leave apart all the technicalities, uh, and they are remarkable, we know that, the basic rules of finance uh, well, it's simple, it's dramatically simple. Buy assets that are going to go in value. Sell assets that are going to fall in value. I mean, it's simple as simple as both sides, nevertheless, include an avoidable preference in the future. Because without that reference, you do not know what you are doing. However, the vast majority of the ways to see into the future exploited by economists are severely constrained. Things are nevertheless starting to change. Uh, in order to understand the micro processes underlying macroeconomic outcomes, one should focus on agents' expectations. That's already a first way of looking into the future. The economic activities that are pursued or avoided are established by expectations. Okay. The problem is that, and here I'm quoting again from that, under conditions of fundamental uncertainty, expectations cannot be understood as being, as being determined through calculation of optimal choices taking into account all available information. But rather, rather are based on contingent interpretation of the situation in the context of prevailing institutional structures, cultural templates, and social networks. It is here, uh, the, 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 the quotation is a bit difficult and I'm coming, I'm trying to unfold some of its complexity uh, in, uh, uh, in the next few sentences. Uh, it is here that Becker introduces the concept of fictional expectation, referring to present imaginaries of future situations that provide orientation in decision-making despite the incalculability of outcomes. The basic idea is What will happen is really unforeseeable. There is no real possibility to make a calculation saying in five months time this or that or that will happen. Nevertheless, we must make decisions. We must buy, we must sell, we must do this or that continuously. And so we should learn to take decisions in a situation in which no proper calculation can be developed. Well, most economists know this, but there is a hidden uh, uh, assumption accepted by mainstream economy. It is the transformation of uncertainty into or is transformation of something that is not calculable in something that may be calculated. That's the way in which, uh, I'm simplifying a lot, but just to, to provide a bit I mean, the, the, the gist of the, of the situation. The reason is the following. According to rational expectation theory, aggregate predictions are correct because individual errors are random. One may make a mistake in this way, the other one makes an opposite mistake. The two mistakes together give an average, and you work in the end on the average. Therefore, predicted outcomes do not diverge systematically from the resulting market equilibrium. That's possibly the main action of contemporary, one of the main action of contemporary uh, economy. As a consequence, the uncertainty of the future becomes a predictable forecast, paving the way for the rational calculation of optimal choices. On the other hand, the true openness of the future 
make it impossible to explain. This is just calculus, not optimal choice. The problem is whether these average calculations in the end really grasp what's happening or not. If they really grasp what's happening, it means that uncertainty has been transformed into this analysis, something that can be calculated. If not, most of contemporary economy uh, there are big question marks on that, and uh, is not so reliable as many pretend it is. Uh, the problem is that these two categories, well, at least since the 20s, are one another orthogonal. It is since the work of night that the difference between uncertainty and the risk has been seen as two opposed categories, not transformable into one into the other. But let's see what Becker is able to extract from these pretty technical uh, issues. In Becker's intention is to reintroduce a difference between risk and uncertainty. So he, he goes against mainstream economy from that point of view. Mainstream and new classical economy. Like that. By raising the question of the nature of expectations and the conditions of uncertainty. Here is his answer. Structurally, expectations depend on cultural frames, dominant theories, the stratification structures of a society, social networks and institutions. But the concept of fictional expectations gives the notion of expectation at the same time a political twist because expectations are seen as being open to manipulation by powerful actors. In order to clarify this concept of fictional expectation better, Becker openly claims that it is the future that saves the present. It is the future that saves the present. Or, to be more specific, it is the images of the future that say present decisions. The fact is that actors must develop expectations, among other things, with regard to technological development, consumer preferences, prices, availability of raw materials, the strategies of competitors, competitors the demand of labor, the trustworthiness of promises, the state of the natural environment, political regulation, and the independence is among these factors. Despite the true unavoidability of the future. So how can we put together these two sides? Hence, Keynes' expectations for better are real fictions. There are bets, in a sense. There are things that we hope, we believe, we fear they may happen. There is no chance of seeing them through the opposition between truth and falsehood. Expectations are neither true nor false. So, from this point of view, they are not part of classical science. Science deals with, with what is true. Eventually, the proper opposition will be based on the difference between convincing as opposed to unconvincing expectations. Some expectations appear convincing, some others appear unconvincing. This is a piece of psychology that enters into the scene. Uh, moreover, expectations are more than mere fantasies, mere fantasies, because actors develop plans that are based on and include expectations. So it's not only something that we fancy. It's something that we fancy at the same time we use for the decision we take. So there is something more than having just an idea of something. Finally, fictional expectations work on an as-if basis. Fictional expectations represent future events as if they were true, as if they were true making actors capable of acting purposefully with reference to an uncertain future, even though this future is indeed unknown, unpredictable, and therefore only pretended in the fictional expectation. Okay. It has been a kind of rush among three very different frameworks 
from three different uh, sciences uh, using different concepts uh, and so the translation between one and the next is not, uh, is not obvious. Nevertheless, all the three papers I've mentioned raise the issue of giving more, a more active role to the future. And there is more than that. All three claim that without a proper consideration of the future, the sciences we are considering, they are partial. I'm not saying wrong, which is too strong a claim, but they do not uh, address the real complexity, the real systemic integration of the problems they try to understand. Which, again, implies something that is not so obvious. It implies the willingness to accept the future as a legitimate topic of research. That's the most important. If we accept that the future is a legitimate scientific topic of interest, well, many things change. And at least, I'm not saying about what I say, but at least the human and social sciences, in the end, will be very different from what we have known uh, so far. And obviously, there are many things that we are still to understand. We are still at the beginning of this of this effort, because it goes against most of what we have been taught about the way in which science should be developed. How can we properly address the future from a certain point of view? There are no data concerning the future. That's a classical uh, reply, that is, which is not entirely true, by the way. But nevertheless, it is one of the, of the components. And, okay, I'm not pretending to give you uh, an answer now. What I'm saying is that three well-respected, very well-known scholars from three different fields, in the same year, they have published three major topics with the same message. Well, that's something. I'm saying only that. Let's have a look. Maybe there is something more we can do. Maybe this may become a topic that the academy may... Uh, this will be for the future. <laughs> it will be something for tomorrow. But it is already important to recognize that there is something in there. Something may change and may even change very soon because it is, I mean, in science when we see this contemporaneity of methods, well, usually something, something drops, something changes. Okay, two, only two uh, minor uh, for a preliminary survey of the ways in which uh, uh, anticipation has been discussed in a number of sites, there is an old paper of mine that gives an idea, and there is the bibliography published by Mihail Nadin, uh, an open bibliography on anticipation uh, in the International Journal of General System. I mean, the only aspect I would like to call your attention on is a hundred page bibliography. I mean, there is something that it is a commented bibliography. Okay. But nevertheless, drop out all the comments, there are a few papers that even if the way in which the papers have been introduced sometimes may be debunked, doesn't matter. There is an enormous amount of research that has been done under a variety of different names and that under a variety of different uh, uh, Nevertheless, there is something we can start from. That's the basic idea. Okay, uh, I think that I, I stop here for today and uh, tomorrow I will add something more on what I will call the discipline of anticipation. So I'm starting from, I'm passing from a descriptive description, descriptive, uh, yes, sketch of anticipation as presented by a number of scholars to what should we need in order to start developing a, 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 a conceptual framework for understanding of this issue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good and very stimulating. Very quickly, 
Uh, I think uh, that uh, it's uh, important to underline uh, that uh, uh, the future is uh, too important to be left uh, to fortune tellers. Through history, you know, and even today, in Italy, it's calculated that, that the fortune tellers make it with the unemployment that 1 million euro a year. In Thailand, big corporation, they hire people asking fortune tellers if they're going to be good employees, and stock exchange people have them because they feel they don't have a reliable terms. But that's really important. I also uh, agree with you, if I understood that you're very interested in that input, that, that uh, you know, how we see the future can be good or bad news. And uh, it can be very bad news uh, if uh, in a caste system uh, like India, I see my future to do what my father, uh, the same job, uh, and so my children uh, and the children of my children. That uh, future anticipation, but it's a disempowering anticipation. As you said, uh, in psychology it's called sense of agency, that also Seligman uh, mentioned so many times, that's uh, an important ingredient. Do we see an empowering future? And, uh, but there are a lot of vested interests in how in our society we, we that visualize the future. The debate about climate change uh, is just uh, one of the names. But another example is women realizing they were oppressed or black in South Africa, realizing that they were oppressed, would not have uh, envisioned a future of empowerment, uh, but a future of continued oppression. They would not have organized their energy to change uh, the future. So that's very important because you can visualize a, a future that enslaves you instead. Then uh, a, a comment that since I'm uh, from psychology and I know Seligman too. Uh, when uh, you negate the past uh, in the science, it's called plagiarism. And uh, we contacted uh, Division 32, our president at the time, Seligman, asking that. Uh, Retribution and why he would appropriate uh, all this idea. But well, I'm not his idea. They are 20, 25, 30 years earlier. As I was mentioned also in the lecture of the other course, uh, Manager in the 30s was saying that human beings are, you know, characterized by making a self fulfilling prophecy. Rogers, Malcolm, Maslow, Chad. Butler, you know, the third force that in a psychology is humanistic psychology. When uh, Dr. Seligman was a little kid. And so, it's uh, interesting that not only Seligman, then he corrected, in my opinion, not good enough, uh, because uh, when uh, somebody uses uh, the idea of somebody else, and uh, has a lot of honor to build on some idea. If he try to say these are, are my idea is actually undermining uh, the whole idea because it loses uh, scientific credibility. This, by the way, is happening all the time uh, in the so-called scientific world that negated past uh, for self-interest. But that's not this uh, the question. The real question is, I was uh, really hit, shocked, by hearing uh, that in some survey of youth, you know, how they visualize their past. When asked who was Adolf Hitler, the kid replied, a punk rock musician. Now, the question I put to you, isn't it dangerous not to be aware of the importance of the future? I totally agree with you. But isn't it also dangerous to erase the past? And so, if you don't know your past, you don't understand it very well your present, then, and you might not be really with the proper tool to have an agency for the future. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, thank you to you for the question. Uh, two uh, aspects. Uh, uh, there is a big history or a big tradition in psychology of this kind of... Uh, I have not 
reconstructed the history of any discipline. I said I will present only three recently published papers, but I said be careful there is a hundred page bibliography and there are, I mean, as many references as you like to what has been done during the past uh, 20 centuries. So, yes, it is important to, uh, oh, it is also important to show that the interest for this topic, as for many other topics, is not something coming out of the blue, but there is something that has been accumulated. There may have been mistakes to be aware of. I mean, the history of a field is important in order to, at least to try to avoid some of the possible uh, mistakes. So, from that point of view, uh, no problem. Uh, I agree with you also on the other, uh, on the other aspect. Uh, we need the past. It is absolutely important because the past is one, if not the most important aspect in establishing at least some aspects of our identity. And so from that point of view, we need to have fit somewhere. Otherwise, uh, I mean, we cannot live in the present only, so to say, from the present. Uh, the problem is, as it was uh, uh, discussed a couple of days ago, uh, we need both of them. Why schools, for instance, should be only past-oriented? We need a proper balance between these three. We need an attention to the present, and that will be the topic of my next lecture. And at the same time, we need to be aware of relevant aspects of our past, and we should be able to figure out possible future. All three are needed, and the problem is the way in which they interact one another. They may interact in a productive, empowering way, or they may generate uh, uh, difficult situations that should be addressed. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, just, just on this point, uh, I, I have a huge problem with the machine here, who started the case and uh, to the larger, shall we say, scientific community, I think this was cookish. I mean, there was no place for someone who claims to be a social scientist and who was interested in something that's strictly as usual. So this nature, many of them were discouraged about um, it. The, 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 this notion that you raised, uh, it has a lot to do with learning and learning theory. And indeed, a, a huge amount of this time in Jimmy's famous book, How We Think. Mm -hmm. And a uh, former president of our, of our academy uh, synthesized some Jimmy's thinking uh, in a speech engaged in the American Public Science Association, in which he said, probably, oh, any problem solved. Effort is going to require integration of five distinct versus an integrated uh, tasks. You have to think through the method of goals and values, how you justify them and get them. Uh, you have to locate your problem along a time space continuum so that a trend would be vital to learn. You have to ask the question why the training is a training, which is really a, 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 a no fashion scientific question. You want to know the conditions that make it the way it is. And then uh, the fourth uh, ask is the question of, of uh, prediction. So futuristic or whatever it's called. Since you can't cause them to the future, you then are, are confronted with uh, the intellectual task of, uh, of, of developing and developing a constant. But where is it going? You have to go back to the values that you, that you sort of clarified to begin with that you get from. And you have to ask yourself, well, what future scenario that is most compatible with the values I, the scientist, desire, and 
and which ones are the ones that actually want to avoid. Mm-hmm. So what you need to know is it's not something causal, but a construct, mm-hmm. a value construct into the future. And then finally, try to solve the problem, right? So you still have to get to the question of, um, of how you approximate, not absolutely, but how you approximate your desirable future and avoid the right desirable. Uh, but that faculty then is the faculty of imagination. So you have to, but it's not an undisciplined imagination. It's one that, that emerges out of the trend, out of conditions, out of the clarification of values, and out of your construction. So, so that has been a very other parts of the literature actually <coughs> alerted to. Uh, and the same man did by the famous book in international called Future Systems of Identity and Work on them. So we explore those questions from a global point of view. If I understood the foundations of this world philosophically, uh, they were largely inspired by white people. And uh, white people, uh, instead of using problem and problem solving, the problem was an event. But the events don't just, they occur in space and time. And events happen on a time space continuum. And events have a duration that's a time factor, which means they go from the past to the present to the future. And, uh, and so, if you were attempting to develop a problem oriented approach, you have to take into account insights right here and about the location of events in space and time, and that time exactly has a similar duration. Um, I suspect that the vast and impressive literature that you cited to is still fighting an old-fashioned battle about the, the the limits of statements that can be meaningful. It can't be meaningful, either it can't be true or false, unless you can show the causal link between the event and the outcome. Uh, and, and that's what you like to make the key objective and make it very final. But reality is obviously more complex than that. And uh, what's been left unexplored is that we still have to find a, a way in which we can take our intuitions about future events that may well fit in our existence and make a discourse about that as meaningful as the other stuff in this uh, scientifically and, uh, and uh, philosophically uh, accurate and, and, uh, and carefully constructed as, uh, as the tradition of limited results and the possible potentials of making it fly to against the good uh, thank you for your uh, rich uh, comment uh, and just a couple of uh, uh, footnotes. Uh, Future Studies uh, was born uh, in the military, in the army, and uh, in the field of uh, big corporations in the 50s mainly. Uh, uh, which had uh, a major consequence, uh, namely that the majority of the practitioners, uh, the majority of futurists, uh, uh, wasn't able to join uh, academic institutions, only some of them joined, and most of them remained the level of practitioners, I mean consulting this kind of activity which again had a major consequence, namely the lack of theory. They may have been great figures as far as sorry, consulting was concerned, and a few methods have been developed by a number of guys and institutions, but uh, uh, the lack of theory uh, became very quickly uh, an obstruction in the in the uh, academic re- re- possibility to recognize and accept uh, those 
activities, my effort, uh, my major effort within the field of, of future studies to develop what we have started to call the discipline of anticipation, meaning that part of future studies uh, that may be eventually uh, receive an academic uh, uh, recognition in the sense that it is theory-based, uh, methodologically robust, uh, uh, in which uh, an, um, uh, the accountability criteria are explicitly raised and respected, this kind of thing. I mean, we can try to maintain future studies as the big covering term in which you can find everything from the most technical guys to the most crazy utopian, and that's fine, no problem. But within that field, if we look for something that in time will be hopefully became more robust uh, and uh, may be able to interact with other scientific uh, disciplines. But we need, uh, I mean, methodological rigor, we need a, ba a theoretical basis, and so on and so forth. So this is an effort that is presently ongoing. Uh, I, will, I, I don't know whether it will be successful, obviously, but there is an effort, at least from a few figures all around the world, to try to go in that uh, direction. Uh, second comment, uh, there is a major difference between prediction and, uh, let's say, anticipation in the way we say understand mm -hmm. it. Let me give you a very simple uh, exemplification in the form of uh, the models developed by uh, econometricians. Econometrics? Okay, those bad. I mean, the people that advise uh, government about the rate of inflation and this kind of thing, which are pretty successful efforts, I consider, but there are a number of important internal limitations. First, they usually are, uh, they usually adopt uh, short temporal windows, six months, one year, two years, they already became something difficult to accept, three, four, five years, well, no one believes the result. They adopt uh, and they use only quantitative data. And more important than anything else, uh, they assume a principle of continuity. I mean, the system we are considering, more or less, will continue to work as before, which is very important and very reasonable, I mean. But we are interested in long temporal windows, we are interested in considering qualitative data together with quantitative data, and especially, we are especially interested in surprises, in novelties, in changes. I mean, so it, nothing bad, I mean, I'm not saying that what econometrics are doing is wrong. Not at all. It's perfect within those limitations. But there is much more than that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in order to address long temporal windows, 50 years time, or whatever, in order to, etc., etc., we need different tools. In which what we have what we have suggested is exactly one of the, we have to figure out possible yeah. futures and give them uh, uh, consider them with all the possible uh, seriousness, mm -hmm. as if they they could really become uh, possible. That's exactly what we are doing. It, uh, the term we use is uh, uh, rigorous imagination. So we need imagination, but it shouldn't be a kind of fancy imagination. It should be as robust and methodologically explicit as possible, because in the end we have to say, but why are you saying this and this and this? Because we have considered this and that. And, and there's a problem, and that's an interesting issue. How can, okay, how can we, understand possibilities, I mean, because it's right to open a space of possible uh, outcomes without pretending this is what will happen. We do not know what will happen. Finally, questions. Uh, underlying all what I've said, there is something that is very difficult to accept from a psychological point of view, perhaps. Uncertainty is not an enemy. Uncertainty is a friend, because at least some degree of uncertainty, because it means possibility, it means freedom. It's if everything were settled once and forever, there is no room for action, there is no room for decision. So, uh, Carlos. Yes, two comments. So, first, uh, thank you. It was very fun. I, I agree 
a lot with uh, what you have presented and the importance of uh, analyzing and viewing things from, from this perspective of the future. So, two comments. Uh, one is just to add a bit of fuel, if you probably know that already, just to add a, a bit of fuel to your arguments with another discipline uh, of evolutionary biology and cognitive science. Uh, the idea by, I don't know if it is his original idea, but uh, at least prophesied by Damian Bennett about uh, popperian creatures, about different types of creatures in the, uh, in the history of the evolution, and the popperian creatures are those who are able to anticipate the, the results of their, of their actions. And the interesting thing is, of course, we are not only the, the only operating creatures. There are so many animals. Uh, the, the typical and nice example is the cat, which is going to make a jump from your armchair to the to the shelf of a library. You know, this kind of jumps which surprise us by their precision. He is doing, or she is doing, uh, anticipation of uh, of actions. She is calculate the, the result. But so that was uh, just a bit more fuel of uh, all that. The other point is, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, more uh, important and much more important, because <clears throat> you talked about the nice between economics and the futures, um, and I cannot agree more with that, but it's much worse than that. <laughs> the connection, if there are anybody who has understood the importance of futures, it's the finance sector. For, for the worse, for the worse, because uh, finance is, as you might know, is no longer about uh, banks lending money to companies to do productive things. It's not even about uh, buying shares uh, on, a, on a stock market and of a company you, you, you trust and waiting for those shares to to increase their value, the, the size of the futures markets and all of those extraordinarily sophisticated instruments which basically consist in doing business out of nothing, meaning the ability to do business if the value of something goes up and also if the value of something goes down and without as the so they, it's a sort of uh, weird symmetry because uh, uh, somehow it breaks uh, the second principle of thermodynamics because you can do business if you are owner of something but also if you are not owner of something as, we, as in the two situations were symmetric. So, the size of the futures markets are, uh, I was just looking at, I got a reference from the economist that they mentioned an estimation of 700 trillion of dollars, you know, the size of the future markets, which is roughly 12 times the total value of, the, of assets, of stocks, market capitalization of all companies in the world. So that's an order of magnitude larger than the... And those guys are setting up the idea that they know what they do and burning the, our future. Because the, the more and the Huge amounts of debt which are created by the system to make it work are burning our future of, of all of us. Mm -hmm. So they have, I don't, I, I mean, it's not a question that they have uh, done fundamental research about the nature of, of time in the future, that they have got the opportunity to build up something completely artificial, uncorrelated to the real world of the activity and economy and make immensely huge value. So this is an area where, where the still of the future is, is very critical for humanity because out of that what you get is that uh, economy, a lot of economic forces nowadays uh, are equally happy or even more happy if things destabilize. Yes, if, uh, if collapses uh, or catastrophes happen, they may be more happy, so that they are not going. To, they are not willing to play for stability. They are playing for instability. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let me be very short because time is, uh, is running. Right. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, uh, they know what they are doing. The problem is not uh, this part of the question. The problem is whether we should allow them to do what they are doing. Period. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> That's all that they are. Because, I mean, they are, they are any money for themselves. Okay. Yeah. For them, it's a good, yeah, well, yeah. something very important. The problem is we, as a society, should give them the, the liberty, the freedom to do this kind, those kind of things. Period. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah. Just a few points. Just to make Mark a little bit of framework. There is some issues by uh, first, uh, each science is defined by the predictability. So I think in every science, or at least most of the sciences, even in social sciences, we already find uh, the area uh, which is mainly directed uh, to look, let's say, in the future, and the possibility of, uh, of using the theories that we have uh, to look in the future more concretely uh, in, let's uh, say, uh, figures and uh, mathematics sense, uh, regression analysis is one of the methodology and statistical uh, forms very often used in sociology and psychology. Uh, and it's quite successful, I would say. Uh, the other thing that I think was uh, slightly uh, initiated by uh, Professor Winston uh, is uh, the framework, which uh, he mentioned values, I would maybe extend it a little bit more value and ethics, value and ethical framework as the basis, how we actually look, the, the, uh, the foundation on which we want to build or see or expect any future. Uh, without it, we are just letting this go in any direction and any possible way uh, without the standards, without and uh, in this sense, uh, I also mentioned, I think, two days ago, a little bit uh, in that uh, there are already normative theories, especially political uh, theory, uh, and uh, related to ethics and uh, more broadly uh, in the area of political philosophy, which actually try to, on the basis of certain ethical and value standards, to um, propose, it's, I would say, as you probably would know, a very Kantian idea, it's in idealist sense, to propose certain, not just legal norms, but ethical norms, political norms, towards which we should um, strive. Okay, uh, I think that... Uh, okay. uh, Why don't we... Ah, sorry. We need not reply to everything. Okay. But we should at least get out the discussion now. So if you want to reply very briefly. But very briefly, uh, two, two sentences. Uh, the, 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 the real issue is to go beyond predictability. And that's uh, the where the, the things start to become interesting. Second, uh, as far as values are concerned, values are intrinsically future-oriented structures. There is no value in the present. There is no value without a, a, a future window. Uh, that's not a Kantian version of value, obviously, but uh, we can eventually discuss uh, things later on. Okay. Uh, thank you for the lecture. The, the caviar economics indicates in the series of publications that uh, there is a tendency rather to have irrational shocking, you know, the decision, the economic decision and the rational. Because of many factors, peer pressure, uh, manipulation of advertising, and so on. If you look at the, the, the visible example, go to the poor neighborhood, uh, African Americans or Latino, you know, many kids are very, very Expensive sports shoes. I say this is not a, 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 you would say that it should be the, the, the priority, but the peer pressure is so strong. I mean, uh, you, you went uh, many similar, I mean, uh, irrational mm -hmm. uh, decisions. So uh, the whole experimental economics also indicates, you know, that we are making irrational, rational. 
I mean the decision. So somehow the school, uh, the, the recent year, the school of rational expectation got a lot of challenges. I mean, the, the rabbit was because the, the crisis and then you, you raised the issue. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we have the problems with uh, how to address the uh, abrupt uh, or radical processes which were not uh, uh, related to the models. And also, I mean, there is a type of political uh, pressure from uh, the uh, from uh, stock exchange, from capital, to do models of short term, because the whole business is uh, short term oriented. They give bonuses uh, based on the quarter report, which is so stupid, which was part of the reason of the business. As you see, I mean, the, the, the whole reform, uh, what, what, uh, you know, Frank and what was the Don, the reform was a failure. I mean, failure, you know, I mean, it was hard to success, I would say. But maybe when you, in your next presentation, you'd like to, you know, elaborate on this, because one of the purposes of this course is we come with different perspectives and we see how they integrate with each other. So now if you reflect on what you've heard from Roberto and what are the implications for the economics, that would be really, you know, fascinating. And Winston, I have a similar point for you. First, thank you very much, Roberto. That was really fascinating. Uh, the issue of values has come up several times. When you, because rather than try to do it now, because I think it's an, too important an issue, but in all that we've discussed and I've heard from you about law, law seems to be theoretically rooted in the past and in precedent. And yet, the future of law is a movement towards values, whichever, whatever those values are. And it might be very interesting to hear from you in your subsequent presentations what a, a greater recognition of the importance of anticipation or the importance of the future is, how that would change our conception of law or the justification for law. Are we justifying law because of what was intended 200 years ago when the Constitution was written? Or are we justifying law on the basis of unrealized values which point towards something in the future? And how is that? Just one word. Yeah. Between the latter part of the 19th century, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a famous made a statement about the whole thing. Law is simply a prediction of what legal officials will impact. Say it again? A prediction of what legal officials will impact. Well, that. And then when it came to precedent, he made the other point he said that as a judge, I can give any conclusion a logical form. <laughs> Meaning that he could justify it. Just Precedents are not really the, the, the critical factor, not the standard thing, but we can understand. But that opened the pathway to the broader. So I think it would be, I mean, to what extent do you think this anticipation is already fully recognized in legal theory, or to what extent, if not, what could be the implications of it in the future evolution of law? That's right. That, that's that's a great, question. That's the great modern debate. Uh, whether law should follow um, a, a scientific positivistic model, which is largely rooted in logic, if you like, uh, or whether uh, there's a great deal more discretion in how law is operationally done. And if that's the case, what are the factors that, that should at least constrain or guide that discretion? And uh, the current modern debate, of course, is that uh, if you say that law should approximate as near as can the, the notion of human dignity, then you have all kinds of uh, reactions and schemes that human dignity is a subjective thing completely undermines the very idea of the Okay, anyway, please come back to it if anything sure. comes to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roberto, thank you so much again. Okay. Thank you.